Edward Tulledge must have caught people's attention when he arrived in the Utah Territory in the summer of 1861. He was a British convert to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And when he arrived, the scholar Benjamin Park told us he was on fire. Tulledge had big ideas about the faith. He wrote poems and plays and editorials and big, thick books about the role he thought Mormonism could play in this larger cultural revolution he had in mind. And to the settlers who were still arranging their community in the Salt Lake Valley, he must have stood out. But Benjamin Park told us the culture shock went both ways. It would be difficult to overstate the difference between territorial Utah and industrial Britain. The world that Edward Tulledge and thousands of Mormons converts left in the 1850s and 1860s in England was filled with factories literary hubs, huge cities. London, they were leaving Liverpool, a large port town, and they'd arrive in America, and then they'd take the train as far as they could, and then they'd take wagons the rest of the way, and then they arrive in the Great Basin, which they see as a desert. The smells, the sounds, the sights, it was all fundamentally different. For someone like Edward Tullidge, who is used to larger cities, working in a print house, it was probably quite striking. Everything seemed maybe uncivilized in his mind, underdeveloped. Not many people had, you know, large permanent homes. And so at first, he probably, like many of the Mormon converts, felt a bit unmoored. But Edward Tullidge was nothing if not a man built for adaptation. So he immediately tried to get his footing. He wrote Brigham Young a letter saying, I am ready to serve the church and the brethren. And he told him, I'm ready to write books and articles. I have a vision of writing a huge literary biography of Joseph Smith in poetic verse. But if you don't let me do that, I'll be fine just making shoes. And then, much to Tolage's dismay, he doesn't hear from Brigham Young. So, a couple years later, he writes another letter and says, I really meant it. I really want to serve Zion. I really want to build the kingdom. Please let me do something. Edward Tolage was always a man on the move, looking for a mission. And even while he went through his own ideological transformation shortly after arriving in Utah, that desire to be useful and to push for some type of big mission, hopefully within the Mormon kingdom, if not without, never dimmed. What does that part of the story say about the Mormon experience? You describe it in your paper as a case study in the evolving nature of belief in general, but also as this guide to the dynamic you know, religious and political cultures that were, were playing out at this time. Like, What does this moment tell us about the larger story here? Edward Tulledge was leaving Victorian Britain, this era of robust industrialization and cultural revolution and workers' rights and literary renovations and people trying to determine what does it mean to be modern. And he was arriving in America at the time of the Civil War and these debates of what being American meant. And it was during that time that Mormonism was growing through leaps and bounds. Because for many people, like Edward Tulledge, Mormonism seemed to offer the answers to modernity's problems. There was something about Mormonism that offered a chance to remake yourself, to remake your community, to remake the world. They hoped to find Zion. And so that's why Edward Tulledge, when he arrives in Utah, one of the first things he says in the letter to Brigham Young is Mormonism has the potential to be a great nation. This religion is going to help transform the nation. 
He believed it had the energy. It had the audacity. It had the leadership structure, the missionary networks to be able to implement the type of social reform that people in England, America, the world over were seeking. It was in Mormonism he believed that the key to the future would be found. This is Radio West. I'm Doug Fabrizio. Today in the program, we're talking about Edward Tulledge, who came to be known as the rebel historian. He described himself as an apostate. That is, he ditched the life of an orthodox believer, but he wasn't an ordinary dissenter. Tulledge believed Mormonism could be used to reform society, but he had a hard time making up his mind just how, as you'll see. Benjamin Park is with us for the hour. Park is interested in these quixotic figures on the margins of society, and Edward Tulledge fits the bill pretty well. I'm also drawn to people who had audacious visions of both themselves and their communities and the world around them. And so at one point, I stumbled upon the New York editorials that Edward Tulledge wrote. But when he is in New York City and he's writing these editorials explaining Mormonism to the world, and first I was, I was taken away by the unbridled optimism he had in Mormonism's future, but I was also taken back by the type of vision he was offering of Mormonism that was devoid of not just polygamy, but of a lot of the theocratic or doctrinal elements of the faith. This is at the time to where Mormons were known as polygamists and theocrats. Hmm. And here was Edward Tulledge presenting a Mormonism that maybe didn't avoid polygamy and theocracy, but at least downplayed and emphasized other things. And I thought, huh, that's odd. And so I started digging into Tulledge a bit more. There's been a few great articles about him. He has himself was a wonderful chronicler of history. Yeah. And very soon I I found in Tulledge not just a fascinating thinker with an audacious uh, vision of what he wanted to do, but a pilgrim, a spiritual wanderer, someone mm. who went back and forth from various different beliefs and commitments, always trying to find the proper venue through which to push his reform. And as someone who is always fascinated with these oddities who are traipsing the boundaries of various moments, I'm like, wow, I can find a lot of that in this singular figure who, much to my uh, enjoyment, wrote about that voyage all along the way. What do we know about his early life, his his upbringing? Um, I suppose he's growing up in Victorian England, so he – I don't know. Dickens comes to mind. I don't know. What do we know about what he's experiencing in, in Great Britain? His parents, uh, at least his father, came from pretty well-off families, although that wealth did not transfer well to his own home. And the, the family he grew up in, his father would teach school or music lessons. And while they didn't experience a lot of wealth, they at least experienced a lot of uh, higher class society. And it was hmm. through family connections that he was introduced to Mormonism. And various members of his family joined with them, although not all, eventually his whole family moves out to Utah even before his uh, family, full family converts. His father converts once they're in Utah. His mother never converts. Uh, but he definitely was experiencing both a high class aspects, which is why he always has a fascination with drama, with poetry, with hmm. music. Uh, his father, once he arrived in Utah, became Utah's first music theorist. He was the first person to publish a, a criticism of music, and his criticism ended up being a bit too harsh, so he had to dial it back, and he was kind of kept out of the, the Mormon press for a while as a result. But he also learned a desire to reform society. He was swept up in a lot of the cultural movements of the age, of that it it is left to you hmm. to transform the world around you. And he took that seriously and he believed and he hoped that it was in Mormonism that that vehicle could finally be found. But what did he believe? It, those beliefs, I know, came, came to evolve. But what did he initially believe and think about the Mormon – theology and Mormon cosmology, the ideas that, that, um, that Joseph Smith, first of all, and then, of course, Brigham Young and others were talking about. Um, and, and don't get to polygamy yet. Like, what was the initial impulse of that part of the faith that may or may not have interested Edward Tulledge? 
Yeah, when he first learned about the church, converted and immediately devoted himself as a missionary in the late 1840s and 1850s, it seems like the things that drew him to the faith were what drew thousands of people. The idea of modern day prophets, apostles, <laughs> new scripture. That's what he went off uh, preaching. And, and we don't have many records about what he did in his first few years in the mission field. But what we do know is by 1852, the mission president came around to visit him and be like, hey, Edward, ha why haven't you been doing your missionary assignments? And found that Edward Tollage had backslid and now had left Mormonism and was a self-proclaimed deist. <laughs> right. uh, now, his story could have ended there because there were plenty of people that took that direction in Britain and America at the time. But he didn't stay there for long. Within a few years, he reconverts to the faith, uh, is hired not just, you know, to do missionary work again. He says his life was nonstop missionary work, but he gets hired at the office of the Millennial Star, which was the church's newspaper in England, hmm. and starts writing all these editorials, specifically attacking deist and skeptical ideas, right. saying that it is in Mormonism and in theocracy, only in the certainty that comes through this revelation, can we respond to the, the crises of the day. It's only through the certainty of this theocratic society, the government of man and the kingdoms of the earth are all falling apart into chaos, into mobocracy, into disunion. It's only through the government of God that you can find solace. Now, that, of course, was a message that many found appealing. That, that was, to many, the framework for understanding the early church, that democracy and human governments had introduced too much anarchy, and you need the strong hand of God to restore it. So at first, Edward Tollage was one of the foremost spokespeople of the idea that Mormonism offered the direct prophetic authority, almost prophetic infallibility, uh, that could restore order to the world. Now, of course, that is going to change in some cases quite substantially in his own world. But at least until the time he moves to Utah in 1861, that appeal to theocracy and rejection of the uncertainty of human wisdom seemed to be his uh, his driving idea. Okay, so... Um we're, we're going to get to some of the particulars of uh, some of those moments that you that you mentioned, but I, I kind of want to back up and just talk about how extraordinary the arc of his sort of intellectual journey seems to be. Um, as you say, converts to Mormonism, then backslides into deism, goes back to the faith, recommits to you know comes to Utah to Zion, then backslides again, becomes part of this reform movement. Um, leaves, comes back, uh, finally comes back, you know, in, in the end. But what does all of this say, do you think? Um, this is what you describe as his fitful engagement with Mormonism. Um, what does this say about the man? Could, couldn't make up his mind? Was he erratic? Was he just energized or impatient or maybe maybe kind of brilliant? What What does all of that say about him? It's easy to take a skeptical approach to Tullidge to say that he was an opportunist. That and and I and I do think it's fair to say at the outset that there were some, both in his lifetime and later, who believed that he went wherever he thought a paycheck could come. Hmm. And when any when he thought that he could make money, you know, defending theocracy and polygamy, that that's what he did. And when he could make money rejecting that, he did that as well. And of course, there's always a human element that we have to keep in mind. But I also think that. Edward Tullidge, like humans in general, are a lot more complicated. While we like to think of faith as a static, unceasing, firm commitment that remains as strong as, you know, a skyscraper, in reality, faith is often tossed to and fro, evolving with circumstances, that there are some elements that you always hold firm and other elements that are a bit more transient, that can flex, adapt, uh, change, evolve. And Edward Tullidge, in some ways, his life is a, is a spiritual weather vane, changing with every few years with different movements. But there are other elements of his, of his belief that were unchanging, his belief mm -hmm. that humanity could be redeemed through a certain prism so long as they work together and bring about Republican uh, principles and, and human equality. That, that's a thing that stays pretty consistent through most of his life, even if the vehicle through which he believed humanity would get to that point changed 
drastically mm-hmm. and often frequently. So it depends on how you look at him. If you look at him as who does he have institutional alliance with at a various time? Yeah, he's a guy tossed to and fro upon the winds of change. But if you're looking at him as a man who believed in the 19th century's promise of reform and adaptation, the age of Darwin, of evolution, of change over the period, then he is one of the most consistent figures of the era. What changes are just the tools with which he is using to build his argument. Okay, so... So Tulledge joins the faith. I want to come back to the timeline for his story. Um, he converts in 1849. As you said, he goes on this on this missionary circuit, you know, three-year missionary effort. And at this point, it seems like he's he's fully in, if he's obviously proselytizing for this for this faith. But that lasts about three years, and that's when he has his first falling out. This is in 1852. And as you said, he starts to toy with this idea of of deism. And you've mentioned in your writing that it's not entirely clear what the reason here is. It it could have been uh, polygamy started to bother him. It it could have been something else. But it seems also that what was going on for Edward Tulledge was that he saw poverty and injustice. And it seems like he just was wondering, well, well, how does a loving God allow for this to happen? Is is that part of what he's thinking? Yeah, absolutely. On, on the one hand, we may never fully know what he was going through at the time, but there there's all these contextual clues. First, as you hint at, in 1852 is when the LDS Church announces that they're practicing polygamy. And that news hits the British saints rather hard because not only was that not known, you know, in the general public, but the church was adamantly denying that they were practicing polygamy. And so that's why most British saints who Mm. move out to Utah before 1852 are often shocked when they arrive and and they find polygamy. And then the saints who are still in England, like Edward Tullidge and his family, they hear about polygamy. And it's it's a moment of crisis. They think, oh my gosh, this religion that I've believed in, that I've been defending, that I've been proselytizing, has actually been practicing this odious principle that they've been denying. So the principle itself is bad enough, but we've been denying, lying about it for so long. So that's another major issue that they had to get over. But then there's also the contextual clue that you brought up, that maybe... Mormonism isn't the best venue through which to reform society because Edward Tullidge goes around as a missionary and he probably realizes that most of the people that is adopting the Mormon message are coming from the lower rungs of society, who are those, the outcasts, the people being marginalized by the new industrial age, who don't have enough money for food and clothing and housing. Um, And Mormonism provides them a sense of purpose, mission, salvation, but maybe it doesn't actually improve their material constraints. And it's at the same time that you have a spread of rationalism and enlightenment deism in Britain saying that it's religion holding people back. It's not allowing them to see the temporal salvation uh, because they're so focused on eternal salvation. And it's possible that Edward Tullidge listened to those messages. And that's why he bought into deism saying that, okay, yeah, I'm still devoted to reforming mankind, but maybe Mormonism isn't the right way to do it. Maybe enlightenment and deism and skepticism and this rational Christianity, Unitarianism at the time is is becoming the buzzword for huh. these types of enlightened reformers. And then that's probably why as soon as Edward Tullidge is back in the Mormon fold, then those are the very arguments that he tries to blow up, that he says, actually, those rationalists, they are putting too much emphasis on human ability, that it's not in the human mind and enlightened reason that's going to reform society. It has to be through God and his scepter of truth, through prophetic authority. And yeah, yeah, there's polygamy, although he never really is a public spokesperson for polygamy. Yeah, there's polygamy. But what what's really here is modern day prophets, and they're going to be able to tell you what to do. They're going to be able to establish order. And that's why eventually he goes out to Utah, because he believes that's what's going to be the solution to these problems of poverty and suffer, suffering, is God's people gathering together and establishing Zion. So he toys with deism for a hot minute, 
he believes God is aloof and disinterested. And then he comes back and he goes all in on the role of religion and God in people's lives. In fact, he comes to believe, if I get this right, that Mormonism should be a part – should be a kind of a theocracy. That, that, that's his view at this point? Yeah. His, his arguments while he's working for the church's newspaper in the late 1850s is for a theocratic governance. Hmm. He believes that like Joseph Smith argued, like Brigham Young argued, that the governments of man are crumbling. They're insufficient to respond to the problems of the modern age. The only thing that's going to restore it is God's priesthood. And so Edward Tullidge is embracing this theocratic mission which even if not everyone embraced it with as much gusto as Edward Tullidge, who joined the church, that was an inherent point. If you're, if you're willing to give up your old life, convert to Mormonism, and move to Utah, that means you're placing quite a premium on the theocratic dictates mm-hmm. of the church leaders who are telling you to do that. And so at least for that moment, Edward Tullidge found in theocracy the best venue to solve modernity's ills. So religion wasn't to be in Tullidge's mind just this Sunday affair. It was to play a critical no, role I, in the life of countries and communities and ordering society basically. It's – it's all encompassing that the separation of church and state was a problem to a degree. Now, of course, in America as a secular republic, it seemed to be the problem more so. But even in England, where you still had a, a divine monarch, the separation of the divine monarch unwilling to step into political matters is what Edward Tullidge found as so lacking. So then you, you, you write about the fact that as he's thinking about this this really ambitious role of God and religion in the the running of society, that he conceives of this um, kind of this epic literary work. He wants to write a book that, I I don't know, I think it's how he puts it, is that he thinks is going to rival Homer and and Milton. what's, What's his idea here? Yeah, he believed that if Mormonism was the crowning achievement of human development, that means the figures of Mormonism, the story of Mormonism, should also be the culmination of human literature. And so he proposed to write a poetic biography, a story of Joseph Smith in verse uh, that was going to rival Homer and others and be able to demonstrate the, the potential of humankind, tying back to his great man theory of history. Uh, that that is through these singular uh, figures who are strong enough to transform society, especially when they are led by God's will. And so when Edward Tullidge moves out to Utah and then writes Brigham Young, he is like, I really want to write this book. Uh, I I'm willing to be a a shoe uh, maker if necessary, but I really want to write this book. And yeah. unfortunately, at least for the few first few years, he was stuck being a shoemaker. He doesn't want to be a shoemaker. Right? No, not at all. Not at all. That that's the performance of humility. Right? He's <laughs> right. trying to play a role because he always believed that society history hinged on these singular consequential figures as well as their historians who told their stories. And so ta- if anything else, Edward Tullidge was always seeking that that romantic hero that is going to transform the world so that he can be their court reporter. It's Benjamin Park. He's an associate professor of history at Sam Houston State University. He wrote a paper about Edward Tullidge for the journal Dialogue. We'll have a link to it on our website, RadioWest.org. You're listening to Radio West. All right. Let's talk about his um, his trip to New York. Uh, in 1866, he he moves to New York City, and the idea, is, as you've said, is to defend Mormonism to the world. W- what does that mean? Yeah, because the Mormonism he was defending in 1866, 67, when he goes to New York, was very different than yeah. the Mormonism he was defending as a missionary in the early 1850s hmm. and the theocracy that he was talking about in the late 1850s. 
When he goes out, this is end at the end of the Civil War. The Transcontinental Railroad is about to connect Utah to the brighter world, broader world. And so Brigham Young and the church recognize that we need to be able to put on a face, that we are not going to fall apart uh, in front of this new connection to the world. And mm-hmm. that's when the church finally gets behind Edward Tullidge and says, you are the person we've been waiting for. You go out. So Edward Tullidge goes out, starts rubbing shoulders with all the editorials and editorialists and writers and newspaper authors out in New York City and is able to place a series of editorials in some of the most foremost literary magazines and thinky, I think that's an academic term, the thinky journals of New York City, um, introducing Mormonism in the world, saying, hey, it's not as bad as you think. Now, he's talking about a certain type of Mormonism. He's not talking about polygamy because he never was a devoted believer in polygamy. He has, he's married to two women at once, both end in a divorce, and, and we could get into personal relationships if you like, but he wasn't a very successful family man, doesn't have children with either of those first two wives. Um, so he doesn't talk wait, about wait. polygamy. Wait, wait, he's a, he's he a, po- he's a about- polygamist? <clears throat> Yeah, he marries two women, one his cousin, um, and what? they hated each other before they got married. And then he marries the widow of another family member who is past uh, having kids' age. Uh, and so they, they both dude, you're bar- you're like- burying the lead. This, this is a this is a really <laughs> an- this is another really interesting element in the life of Edward Tullidge. Right. It's it's almost like he married polygamously to fulfill his duty of Mormonism, even if he didn't believe in it. Wow. Um, And so what he did believe in Mormonism, though, was that there is an energy and audacity behind the Mormon movement. That energy is going to be able to transform the world. So he writes these editorials for the for the eager public uh, and tells them, look, you may think Mormonism is a joke, but Mormonism over the last couple decades, has created this missionary network of thousands of missionaries across the globe devoted to a singular purpose, Brigham Young, that if we just, you know, correct their mission, correct Mm -hmm. their priorities, they're going to be able to use that reforming pulpit purpose to whatever the principles of modernity call. So he's saying that Mormonism is the future of the world, that if you're looking for the next great figure, the next George Washington, the next Oliver Cromwell, it is Brigham Young. And so uh, now this wasn't a very persuasive message to many, but it was at least a bit more, you know, palatable. It was something that many people were like, oh, that's interesting. Maybe Mormonism isn't the threat. Maybe there are more Edward Tullidge's who are able to talk about these things, bridge these gaps. And so Edward Tullidge is able to present a a idea of Mormonism as a reformer to the world that may be not fully true to reality, but seemed quite engaging. You know what's interesting about this moment, I think, is that one of the things that um, uh, he, he, uh, he, he writes is that Mormonism lost their fanatical element and were now ready to participate in society, as, as, as Tullidge put it, in common with other men. So it sounds like what he's saying is forget the theology that you may disagree with. Like the, you know, the three tiers of heaven and a pre-existence and all of those kinds of things and, and polygamy and all that stuff, forget about that part. Um, the the theology doesn't matter as much as the structure. Like there's a framework here. We have missionaries who can go out and accomplish these these things. Um, so he's he's basically recasting Mormonism. I think this is how you put it: recasting it from a theological kingdom to a secular empire, right? Yeah, no, that's absolutely the case. He thought that Mormonism, shorn of its fanatical ideas, was going to be a system of governments, of participation, of engagement that could, you know, organize the type of reform efforts that he believed was necessary, that these ideas like polygamy and theocracy and the three-tiered heaven, those are just the theological excesses that come across when you have such a grandiose, audacious vision. And it is the goal of of the modern Mormonism to eventually grow out of those ideas and instead be the reforming impulse. Now, of course, 
Brigham Young's not going to agree with any of this, nor are many Mormons, but they could at least see the political capital that comes from this type of secular vision of the church. I don't want to make too much of this question, but do you at all think Edward Tulledge in sort of abandoning the theological claims in the interest of the, you know, sort of more uh, organizational order or structure – or even the sort of the cultural appeal of of Mormonism, does he at all seem like some modern Latter-day Saints today who aren't that crazy about the exceptional claims of the faith, even some of the particular rules, but but like being Latter-day Saint? Does – I don't know. What do you think about that? Yeah, I – I think that that's very true. And and Tulloch actually had a word for this. He stopped, you know, talking about Mormonism and especially the Mormon kingdom. And he started emphasizing Mormondom. <laughs> Mormondom is the culture. Mormondom is the community. That even if you don't believe in those theological ideas and tenets and and theories, that you you are still part of that culture, that it, that it orients you, that it is your society, that you have familial friendship connections that that bind you to that world, even if you don't share their fundamental precepts. Now, there's a lot of, you know, modern Latter-day Saints who might, you know, see some virtues in that. You see the, the term that is now used is cultural Mormons, right? These cultural Mormons who may not be believing, but they're, you know, practicing or at least part of the community. And Edward Tolich can be seen as, as a forerunner uh, to a lot of that, even if, you know, some of his ideas and practices might be a bit uh, alien, like any 19th century figures would be if you compare it to the present. So he he's in New York, figures he's going to stay there a while, but he doesn't stay there all that long. By He, he leaves in, to go to New York in 1866. By 1867, you say he he's back in the Utah Territory. And then just two years later, I think this is 1869, He's yeah. fallen out of the faith again. There's, there's a lot going on in, in, in Mormonism at the time. They're fighting with the federal government. There's the Mountain Meadows Massacre. I'm not sure what effect any of those sorts of things had uh, on him. But something seems to have happened in his regard for the faith but, but also for Brigham Young because he writes at this particular time in 1869 that he had um, – and this is in your in your paper, this quote, that, that he had settled into a philosophical state of religion, anchoring faith in the divine mission of the world rather than in the mission of any special prophet. What is he what is he yeah. getting at there? On the one hand, in that very same letter and editorial that, that you're quoting from, he said he'd kind of been in that state for about seven years. So he was even thinking that when he went on his mission to New York and was writing for the church. Hmm. But he hadn't fully come to the consequences of that or, or embraced the, 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 the implications. And so once he returns from New York City, a number of his closest uh, friends and potential patrons um, end up taking a different track. They say that they're rejecting Mormonism uh, and Brigham Young as too too, uh, totalitarian and too tyrannical and that Brigham Young was putting his fingers on too many economic measures, not allowing us uh, the freedom. There are also people getting involved in the spiritualist movement at the time. <laughs> and they center around this individual named William Godby, who yeah. was a successful businessman in Salt Lake City. And their dissenting movement ends up becoming the Godbyites as a result. They call it the, the, the liberal church. And Edward Tulledge joins them. Now, on one hand, Edward Tulledge matched their ideas. They saw themselves as progressive reformers. They they believed in democracy. They wanted to find more, uh, you know, commonalities with the broader American culture rather than the retrenchment that Brigham Young was offering. But Edward Tulledge didn't share some of the other elements. Edward Tulledge wanted to be a the church to be his patron, so he certainly didn't think the church should step out of, mm-hmm. you know financially controlling the society. He also didn't believe in spiritualism, which was a key tenet of a lot of the Godbeites. So he was always a a 
odd fit with the Godbeite descent, which is ends up being ironic because he becomes their primary historian. And so the Godbeite movement ends up being seen through his lens until later historians are able to see the Godbeites uh, distinct from Edward Tulledge. But what the Godbeite descent movement does in 1869 and 1870 is it further breaks him from the church. He, mm-hmm. he just realizes his vision of the universal man, the, the constant idea that he's pushing for throughout his career, that it's just not going to be achieved through orthodox LDS belief. And so from that time on, time on he's never fully reconciled with the mm. LDS church, although, as we'll discuss, there are moments where they have a, a, a loose alliance. But the Godbeite movement fully breaks him, and he just realizes that the whole vision that I see of redeeming society and reforming the world more can play a role in it, but it's not going to be the primary vehicle. At what point does he start calling himself an historian? Um, he, you say, he positioned himself as kind of this anthropologist, who's who's documenting the evolution of these religious communities. Um, he, uh, Tullidge himself, wrote that history is the most infallible revelation. Um, so. So talk about this this moment. He's sort of still in the faith. He's certainly still here. He's hanging out with other Latter-day Saints. I don't know. Does he go to church? Does he not? But it seems like he's setting himself apart now as this intellectual um, who's going to document the experience, maybe not play along with others. Is that right? Yeah, he- he ad- he identifies himself as an apostate, uh, even during this next period we're going to be discussing where he's writing histories about the church and quasi for the church. He still identifies himself as an apostate. So it's unlikely that he's attending church. He certainly doesn't believe in things. I I don't think he ever gets rebaptized, although that 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 the record seems to be a bit murky on that. Mm. Um but what he starts doing is like, actually, it's time for me to return back to the project that originally brought me to Utah. He approaches Brigham Young and says, hey, I want to write that biography. But he does a very smart thing. He says, but instead of writing about Joseph Smith as the great man, I want to write about you as the great man. Mm. That Brigham Young is the, is the pivot point upon which uh, modern the modern world is going to change. And Brigham Young actually agrees. Uh, in some ways, Edward Tulledge had, had earned his graces back to the church. He, he was one of the founding editors of what became the Salt Lake Tribune and was a friendly voice in there. He starts pushing back against the other Godbeites and their critiques of Brigham Young. He tips Brigham Young off when uh, some of the Salt Lake authorities are going off to arrest him for some polygamy prosecution. And Brigham Young was like, all right, you've done enough. You've suffered enough. Let's, let's allow you to write. And so he provides uh, Edward Tulledge the material to write a biography of, of Brigham Young, very much in the great man school of history. Hmm. He writes that. And then he moves on from that to writing his uh, se- uh, The Women of Mormondom, which uh, in my uh, view, his, his masterpiece, this history of the many women of Mormonism, uh, Eliza R. Snow plays a big role in helping him uh, write that and gather materials. In many ways, it is a direct response to a lot of the anti-polygamy material in America that were casting Mormon women as dupes. And Edward Tulledge, in many ways prescient of later historians, saying, actually, the Mormon women are much more fascinating than the dupes that they're depicted as in a lot of these anti-polygamy stuff. And the women of Mormon dumb is to a great degree the first feminist history of of Mormonism. And then he moves on to his third history, which was a biography of Joseph Smith, the biography he always envisioned to write. And and he finally writes that one, although that one ends up getting him in trouble for uh, some fun reasons. We'll say. You've you've interested (laughs) Um, us. Yeah, so the big thing that changes between him writing the biography of Brigham Young, which seemed to be well accepted by church and Brigham Young appeared to like it. And and his later biography of Joseph Smith is Brigham Young died. And John Taylor was not as big a fan of, of Edward Tulledge. And when Edward Tulledge wrote his biography of Joseph Smith, he 
did a very smart marketable move to where he basically implied that it was a church production. He he said that <laughs> several church figures had helped him revise and write this work, almost giving it, you know, a, an impromptu of of approval from the church. And John Taylor was mad. He was like, you are trying to use a, a church membership to suit you when it helps, and you're trying to act as an apostate when it helps you there. In fact, there is one uh, moment, a, a heated meeting between John Taylor and Edward Tulledge, where Taylor tells him, when you're in the East, you act as an apostate because that's what is profitable. When you're in Utah, you act as a saint because that's what's profitable. Profitable. Going back to what I said from the very beginning, there's always questions of, you know, personal interests there. And so Edward Tulledge is dejected that the church doesn't embrace his long promised project in the Joseph Smith biography. But, but you know who does enjoy the Joseph Smith biography? Joseph Smith III, hmm. the prophet of the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ, headquartered out in the Midwest. He writes Edward Tulledge, and Edward Tulledge jumps at the opportunity, moves out to the reorganized church, is baptized an RLDS member, becomes an RLDS historian, rewrites his biography of Joseph Smith to turn it as an anti-polygamy, anti-Brigham Young screed, and then publishes it as an RLDS publication. But this this latest, most surprising uh change in Edward Tolge's many religious transformations also ends up being the briefest because he then gets sent out by the RLDS church as a missionary to Utah. He wow. arrives back in Utah and realizes he likes it in Utah better than out in Missouri. And so he affiliates with the LDS church once again. But how can he do that? It seems like if you've written a screed against Brigham Young, if you've said terrible things about polygamy, you've burned your bridge. But it doesn't seem like – it does seem like people take him in again or, or does it? Yeah, I think a, a few elements. One is I'm not sure how well known his RLDS screeds against Brigham Young and polygamy huh. became known in Utah by huh. the time he comes back. And so there's a question of that. But there's also a question, an element that often complicates our stories and we forget when we think about past figures is – Personal connections are often more important than ideological purity. And that by the 1880s, Edward Tolledge had deep, deep connections with a lot of elite figures in Utah. And they're willing to overlook the crazed ravings of, you know, your Uncle Ed. Um, and, and so I, I, I think when, when he goes out again, there's, he, he's never fully embraced by the church. It doesn't seem like he's baptized again. Yeah. Uh, he's not, you know, set up as a, a church foremost speaker. But he does go out and he's the, the church help, and Utah helps him. And he writes a number of other really important historical works. His history of Salt Lake City was a really important historical book that in some ways was sponsored by the church, gathering documents of the, of the early settlement of Utah and, and Mormonism's uh, earliest years in the Great Basin. And it all seems to be based on these connections that he's built. And so mm -hmm. as much as a man of ideas he was, it seems in the end, it's the man of connections that would save him at various points. That's the historian Benjamin Park. We're talking with him about the life of Edward Tulledge. You're listening to Radio West. How do you describe the last years of his life? One of the things you've mentioned, when John Taylor says, you're just trying to sell books, it doesn't seem like you agree. Um, you don't think he was just trying to make money. You seem to believe that his, as, as you put it, his spiritual pilgrimage was sincere. And he had such grand visions for trying to transform society using the structure of Mormonism. It was like this cultural revolution he wanted. But – what did all that amount to? What did he actually, do you think, accomplish? When you look at Edward Tulledge through the lens of John Taylor, all you see is an opportunist because the only thing that matters is are you a devoted member of the LDS church? And mm. obviously Edward Tulledge was not over the years. Yeah. But if you look at Edward Tulledge through his own lens, a man who is constantly seeking for the right vehicle, just the right prism through which to see the world and initiate revolution— 
that's actually a constant throughout his life. And what changes are the vehicles he uses to go along that road that he was devoted to find the best mm. way to redeem humanity. And whatever seemed to be the best route to do so, he embraced. And so how you view Edward Tullidge is going to come down to what you see the prior priorities of that vision are. Um, Edward Tullidge was not one that saw institutional alliances as the most important badge in your life. In hmm. fact, he saw that as pretty ancillary, as transient, as something that's replaceable. It was the ideas, the reform that was more crucial. But in a world that prioritized institutions like John Taylor's church, that doesn't have much of a place. So could it be said that Edward Tullidge was was famous in his day around here. He was never as famous as he wanted to be. <laughs> um, he was never as successful. Even his later history books never sold that well. Uh, he had the the misfortune of publishing his, his big history books in the 1880s at the same time that Hubert Bancroft was publishing his history of, of Utah and other historians were. And so, uh, I, I mean, his last book, they printed... 2,000 copies and only a, a few hundred sold. So he was never that famous, but he was well known. If you were to ask Eastern in, uh, East Coast intellectuals, who do you think the best spokespeople of Mormonism are? Many of them would have just known about Mormonism through Edward Tullidge. Wow. And then if you were to ask the elite in Utah, who do you think the best cultural critics of the church are? Or who, who are our best historians or dramatists or, or poets? Edward Tullidge would have been the pe one of the people they brought up because of his books, because of his magazines and his and his editorials. So so he was pretty popular, but he never reached the great position of esteem and prestige that he at least believed he deserved. So final question. Why don't more people know about Edward Tullidge? What, he's an incredibly fascinating figure. Well, um, as a historian, I'll say one of the reasons is there hasn't been a great biography written of him yet. So nice. maybe that, that's still left to be done. Um, but I think also, as I mentioned before, it comes down to your priorities. And Edward Tullidge did not prioritize institutional allegiance, which means when you die, there's no institution that's going to prioritize your memory. Hmm. And so because Edward Tullidge was part of so many different movements, he was parts of so many different uh, uh, groups and organizations and even churches, but those alliances were always fleeting. It means he never had a big legacy appointment or legacy within those different groups so that when he died, his words died with him. There weren't people remembering him. Hmm. And so... Because he never came up with his great work, because he was never became the great uh, court reporter for the great man that he hoped to be, it just meant that he reflected the age and that message didn't carry forward, which I believe is unfortunate because Edward Tullidge probably represents a larger percentage of religious believers, not just Mormons, but religious believers <laughs> than the great men and women who do get remembered. Because lots of us are cafeteria believers of whatever you participate in. Lots of us are wa wanderers, pilgrims, moving from point to point. And very few of us ever leave a huge mark footprint on the, the organizations in which we participate. In other words, many of us are like Edward Tullidge's, seeking that great success, but never fully finding it. But it's in that quest that religious affiliation and religious belief is, is truly expressed. Benjamin Park, thanks very much. My pleasure. That's Benjamin Park. He's an associate professor of history at Sam Houston State University. His most recent book is American Zion, A New History of Mormonism. He also has a paper about Edward Tullidge in the journal Dialogue. You'll find a link to it on our website, RadioWest.org. Radio West is a production of KUER. You can subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. And we're on YouTube, KUER 90.1. As always, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at radiowest at KUER.org.
The program is produced by Benjamin Bombard and Tim Slover. Kerry Watson is our executive producer. I'm Doug Fabrizio.